my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil <clears throat> that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. <coughs> Excuse me. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Be seated. Thank you, Nancy. You know, there's a, um, a proverb, Proverbs 2012, I believe it is, and it's, when you read it, it sounds really random. Uh, it says, eyes that see and ears that hear, the Lord has made them both. You're kind of like, okay, that's deep thought. All right, so, all right, so Yeah. Uh, but, you know, honestly, I think that's re actually really profound, and we're realizing in this moment, this cultural moment, how profound that verse is, that God gave us eyes to see each other, mainly, right, and ears to hear each other. We were made to be relational. We were made to take each other in, to see each other, to hear each other, because guess what? We're made in God's image, and that's what he's doing all the time. He sees us. He hears us. He loves us. He knows us. And a lot of us are feeling kind of isolated and fractured and, and cut off. But can I just promise you one thing, and especially those of you watching online, especially you, you are not cut off from God. You are not cut off from the eyes, from the ears of God. He sees you. He names himself after that. He names himself Elroy, the God who sees. And so uh, it's so wonderful when we can come either gather here online and, and, and be together this way or in this room, and, and I hope that we can, we're, the staff is working on ways in which we can gather in smaller settings to see each other and to hear each other and to live out the image of God in us, because it's hard to be separated and in more ways than we realized, and so it's worth the effort, and we're going to be working on more and more of those ways. One, one of those ways is this, this idea of the fellowship here, the red, the yellow, and the green name tags, and um, I'll have on a red name tag, so don't feel like you're the only one. If, if you come, and I'll, I'll be there with you. I'll be red with you. Bo, on the other hand, is wearing his green suit. Uh, so uh, he will, he, he, you're going to see Gumby right here next Sunday. Uh, and so you just you do what works for you and what your conscience works for you. So uh, let's, let's learn to love each other in ways that make sense to each other. Amen? And, and try to see each other and hear each other in ways that we can to make up for the times that we're in. So... Um, Rhetorical question. Don't answer out loud, just get a word in your mind. What humbles you? Got a word? Second question. What shapes you? What shapes your life? Got a word? Third question. What frees you? James is all about that. Verse 22 is kind of the money verse. We're going to start right there. Do not merely listen to the word. Do what it says. Uh, and so, okay, fine. We all agree. Most people would agree. Maybe you're here and you disagree, totally disagree. But most people, in the sound of my voice, would agree we should do what the Bible says. We're kind of raised on that. But some object objections to that come to mind, don't they? Like, 
especially in our, our day, our modern world, which throws off restraint, throws off boundaries, throws off anything imposed on the outside. So we say, look, everyone should do what's right for them. Not, not the Bible, not the Koran, not whatever, not your con- Just do what's right for you. You do you. And it's, like, it's like the old kid saying, you're not the boss of me. Anybody's kids ever say that? You're not the boss of me. The problem is, as adults, we don't shed that very easily, do we? It, 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 does, it doesn't go away. It actually kind of hardens. And we, we learn to say it in politer ways, but that's exactly what we're saying to the world, to our bosses, to the neighbors, to the HOA, to whatever. You're not the boss of me. But if you have had that experience of being born again into the family of God as a son or a daughter of God, if you've had that experience, you have a new relationship with God. You also have a new and living relationship with his word. And so the question is, what practical difference does this book have in your life on the street, in the wild, okay, at work, behind the wheel, in a store, with your family, doing lawn work? Where, how does this book impact you? Because I think most people think that Christianity is something we do an hour a week to tick the box, to make sure I get more good things in the hopper than bad things in the hopper, and get in the gate. That's what a lot of people think the Christian faith is about, and they could not be more wrong. It is about a living relationship with God. Nike's just do it. God is so much deeper than that. And I want to show us three things this morning. Actually, James shows us three things this morning about the Word that I think are hugely encouraging and needed in our day. And I hope you'll be blessed as I was blessed. So, Father in heaven, as we look now at your Word, Lord, I have nothing, but Lord, you have everything. You are full of infinite wisdom and glory and truth, and I pray that you would just set our hearts aflame. You would put us back on the right course. You would raise our hearts, lift our hearts, lift our eyes to see amazing things in your word and to be encouraged and blessed and strengthened as we see things, not as we have perceived them, but as they really are. Lord, help us to look into this mirror and to see you as you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So, to keep it quick and, uh, and short, especially for those who are watching online, we are going to jump right in. The first thing about the Word is that encourages me from this text is, number one, that it humbles me. And you're thinking, now, that's not encouraging. And the reason is that our culture associates humility with humiliation. I've been shamed somehow or put down or made low. But let me tell you what the Bible's view of humility is stripping us of our self-delusion and giving us the gift of reality. That's humility. Showing us God not as a little bigger, you know, like, you know, like babies, adults, angels and demons, God. You know, like a little bit bigger than everything else. No, it's like everything and infinitely high God. Like, it's just putting us in our place. It's just showing us who we are. And it's a gift, it's a gift. Aren't you tired? Is anyone else tired of trying to run the universe? I just get right on God's throne all the time. And it's tiring to be God. It is. But some people pretend like it's not, and they kind of like it there for whatever reason. I, I kind of get tired of it, and I should just know better. But the word reminds me there is a God, and I'm not him. All right? And so that humility just strips me of the self-delusion and puts me in my place, and that is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is fitting. That, and from the text, sorry, from the text, if we back up one verse to verse 18 and kind of start one verse back, oops, going to whip out my glasses here. So one verse back, verse 18, here it is. He chose to give us birth through the word so that we might be a first fruits. So in other words, our very origin, our very birth into the kingdom of God, into the family of God is through the word. It's not that I had this buffet of options and I chose God because I thought that would be the best ticket in the long run. No, God chose me. He spoke to me and gave me life and raised me and pulled me into a relationship with himself. And the proof texts for this are many, but a beautiful one, the one that I like, you'll see why. Genesis 1. God takes the dust and makes a mound. That's why some of my friends 
call me dirtbag because that's what the name Adam means. It means earth man. Heather was like, make sure they know it's not me. No, it's not Heather. It's, it's my friends that have had just too much Hebrew for their own good, you know. And so the, the Hebrew name Adam means earth man, right? So earth. And so, uh, <laughs> and if you would have seen me after the yard work yesterday, I would have fit the bill. Anyway, you know, you, when you take off your shoes and your feet are white and the rest of you is not, yeah. Uh, and so uh, he gave us birth. He, he made this mound of dirt and God breathed life into his nostrils and he became a living being. And so God, through his word, through his breath, is, that's what it's called. It, when, when Timothy says the, the word of God uh, is God breathed, it's theonoustos, it's God breathed, it's the word of God, is his breath that comes out, it's his life literally coming out into the universe, it's the life of God. And he breathed it into Adam and he became a living being, and that's how we were born in the beginning, and that's how we're born again now. God speaks to us and brings us to life, just like Jesus did at the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he said that to all of us. He said, Mitchell, come forth. Bill, come forth. Leslie, come forth. Jesus said that to each of us who have come to life. And so that should humble us that he is God and we are not. He called us to be his children. We did not. And he is, and we follow him, our good shepherd. And notice, we're talking about the word of God. And the reason is because, you know, the whole first part of the chapter and the first 18 verses are talking about trials and temptations, how to stand through trials and how to stand against temptations. And the way we do that, James goes now, is this whole passage right today uh, is about the word of God. These 10 verses are about the word of God. And he calls it, you know, the word in verse 18, the word in verse 21, the word in verse 22. But in verse 25, he calls it something different. He calls the Bible something different. What does he call it in verse 25? The perfect law, right? The perfect law. He kind of switches gears from the word to the perfect law. Why does he do that? Why does he characterize the word as the whole Bible, as the perfect law? Because in, there are laws in the Bible, right? There's laws in the Old Testament, Ten Commandments and so forth. But there's also poetry, there's prophecy, stories, narrative, songs, lots of things. Why is the whole thing the perfect law? Actually, Jesus did this too. It wasn't, it wasn't a blip. Jesus said, as it says in your law, and then he quotes the Psalms. So Jesus characterizes the whole Hebrew scriptures as the law. Why does he do that? What's the point? Jesus and James are saying that the whole Bible is normative for us. The laws, the prophecy, the poetry, the songs, the stories, it's all normative for our lives. It's perfect. And it's God's revelation to us. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water who's, who bears its fruit in season and whose leaves does not wither. Everything he does prospers, not so the wicked. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. So we, they are our delight and our joy. And so we are called into a humble relationship with God through his word, to delight in his word, not just to delight in the words, but to delight to be transformed by the words, that we delight to submit our lives to the word because the word of God is not just a book. It doesn't claim to be a normative book. It claims to be the voice of God. That's why we call it the word of God and not the word of Moses or the word of David or for that matter, the word of James. Because if that were the truth, if it were just James writing good ideas and good philosophy and good morals or ethics, there's zillions of those books. Take your pick. But the Bible claims to be above them all because the author is God himself. And so that's what humbles us. And, th and that's what it means to delight in the law of the Lord is that we delight for God to show us the way, to tell us the family stories that shape us. We all have family stories. There's a certain story I like to hear my dad tell just over and over again. It never gets old. It was about in his 
uh, childhood, how they were down at the coast with some families and a boat capsized, and the boat that went out to get them also capsized because they put three men in one of those little boats. You know how it was in like 1958? Like, you know, the biggest boats you could find had a 2.2 horsepower motor, you know, and, you know, you could probably paddle faster. And, um, and then, you know, and then they got saved, and they, the, 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 the people that were, you know, in trouble got saved, and then the rescuers got saved, and the whole big thing happened, and it's just this great story. It's a great story. And I, hear, I love to hear it over, and it kind of shapes the way I think about our family and about our life. And God has told so many stories that shape us, that shape us. And the, he calls it this perfect law. Not just the laws, not just the poetry, the pro- all of it is perfectly, it, perfect, it works perfectly together. And it is perfect in at least five ways. It is perfectly divine. It is God-breathed. Secondly, it is perfectly authentic. God's voice was written and faithfully transmitted down to us. We have, in the New Testament alone, 5,800 Greek manuscripts of our New Testament. Okay, there's, there's only about 1,000 pages in your New Testament. And we have 5,800 copies of it from the ancient world. 25,000 copies in other languages, Egyptian, Syriac, Coptic, uh, uh, Aramaic, and so forth. Um, And then we have a million quotes from the church fathers of our New Testament. So it is authentic word passed down to us. It is perfectly true. What it says is right. And divine mystery is constantly anchored in human history. All the things that are discovered in Israel, these ancient manuscripts and ancient uh, uh, engravings and so forth, all point to the truth. And there are, I could just get, it's another talk for another day, but there are dozens, hundreds of actual physical artifacts that prove people in the Bible, okay? It is true. And lastly, it is sufficient. It is all we need. He doesn't answer every one of your individual questions, but it does give us the DNA, the divine DNA, to, to, to meet all of, the, all of the challenges that we face. It is sufficient. The Word of God is enough, for life and godliness and happiness. So, good. So that's, it is all of these things. And, and so, verse 25, and, and we access these things when we look intently into it. Verse 25, it says, the man who looks intently into the perfect law. Now, Thomas Manton, writing in 1651, reminded us what that um, word, look intently, um, uh, means. When he says, looks, that word to mean look intently, he's used five times in our New Testament. Here's one, so there's four other times. Out of the four remaining times, two, half of them were different gospels describing Peter leaning in. It says, uh, Manton says, it's a metaphor to lean in, taken from those that do not only glance upon a thing, but they bend their body towards it, that they may pierce it with their eyes and narrowly pry into it. The same word is used for the stooping down of the disciples to look into Christ's tomb in Luke and in John. And in the, a third one is when uh, angels are used to find out the mysteries of salvation. The angels themselves look intently to understand the mystery of God's salvation. That's the word that's used here. That the man who looks intently into the word of God is rewarded for that search. Okay, if you've, if you've not been listening or you went and got a coffee, fantastic. Listen to this. Because typically, the Bible, people understand it as advice, to kind of accept or reject. They treat it like kind of if, if equal with them, if not below them. So it's like a catalog. So we, we sit up over here looking down at the Bible, and we page through it saying, I like this, not this, I like this, not this. And we look down on the Word and judge it, when in fact it should be the opposite. The Bible is up here, and the Bible should page through our lives and say, I like this, not this. I like this, not this. The Bible gets to decide who we are because we were made in the image of God and the living word has given us his image here and this image should be the image to which we are conformed. And so the Bible literally reads us. And there's a guy who wrote a book about that, of course. Uh, So, Jean-Louis Chrétien was a French philosopher, theologian, thinker of the last century. He wrote this great book, Under the Gaze of the Bible. It's on uh, my shelf. I meant to bring it in here. Didn't. Translated by um, John Marsden Dunaway. And so I actually knew John Dunaway, know John Dunaway, uh, who, who translated this. But he, this, in this book, is called Under the Gaze of the Bible. And so what he's saying is that we are the ones who are under the gaze of the Bible, under the gaze of the Word. And the Word itself is reading us. 
And he says it this way. The analogy of the mirror here in James completes the one of the letter before by showing that the Bible can reveal us to ourselves. Scripture is a mirror to the soul, is a place of self-recognition. To flee this recognition is also to flee oneself and to, be, and to seek to be ignorant of yourself. That's what James is saying, to look into the mirror and walk away and forget who you are. And Hredian is saying, we, if we flee the Bible, then we flee who we are, we lose our identity. And believe me, you don't, and the world is full of these people. Who am I? What do I mean? Why am I here? And we're acting like there's not obvious answers when here are the answers. You don't have to go with the Beatles over to India and smoke mushrooms. You can find it here, who we are, who God is. The world is looking for who it is, and here it is. Identity. Our origins, Genesis 1 and 2, we were made in the image of God. And not just men, but women, co-equal, image of God. In male and female, he made them in his image. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the world of hurt over the millennia that could have been avoided if we just would have grasped that one concept in Genesis 1, that men and women were made equally in the image of God, both honorable. Yes, different. He made them male and female. He didn't make them male and male or female. He made them different, but co-heirs. First Peter 3, 7 talks about this. Husbands, love your wives uh, according to knowledge. As the weaker vessel, so she has a different kind of a body, but as co-heirs with Christ in salvation and equal with God, and equal with you before God, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So like, there's even a clause about that. Think of the ills that would have been avoided in the world if just that one chapter Genesis 1 was grasped that our origins were understood well and our origins lead to our meaning why are we here well we're made in the image of a triune God three in one Father Son and Holy Spirit there's unity and diversity so also we have unity and diversity I've got a mind I've got a body I've got a soul yet they're all me somehow and not just me as an individual, but us as a community. Now we are relational not just as an individual, but we are relational as, as, as us, like God has in the Trinity. And so when that, when that fellowship is broken in quarantine and we realize how isolation affects us negatively, it's because in Genesis 1, God made us in his image for community and for fellowship. He made us with eyes that see and ears that hear so that we could take each other in and respond to each other. And that's why quarantine hurts, because that's how we're made. So that's our meaning, is to more and more conform ourselves to the image that, in which we were made. Our morality, how should we live? As God lives, in his image. And our destiny, where is it all going? Well, there's a book about that in here, too. And so our origin, where we came from, our meaning, why am I here? Our morality, how should I live? And our destiny, where is it going? All answered, all shown in the word all a gift to shape our lives and it's all the perfect law of god man so much so here's the question if you're struggling about with the word of god the question is this is jesus the son of god and it's the same question in different words did jesus rise from the dead because if he rose from the dead, then he, he is who he claimed to be. He claimed to be the Son of God. So if he did that, if he did that, read his book. Read his book. Follow him. What can we do when, when all the disciples, when, when the big group found it hard to follow Jesus and left, and he turned to the disciples and said, well, you leave too. They said, where would we go? You have the words of life. Like, we don't get you, and you're really strange, and I don't understand what you're saying right now, but you're it. So here we are, and we're going to follow you. And you know what? I kind of feel like that right now. Do you? Anybody else? God, I don't know what you're doing right now. You're kind of weird to me. This whole 2020 thing, yeah. but you're it. You have the words of life. Where else would we go? Where else, like really, where would we go? Trust ourselves? 
Trust each other? Trust the government? Heaven help us? And if you think moving to Panama is going to help you, try it. <laughs> I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying there's no answers. God gave us our rulers. Full respect. God gave us rulers, so we respect them and we, we, we honor them. But at the end of the day, they're not God. And we follow the Lord. He shapes our lives. He shapes our lives. And so that's, that's that second point. He shapes us. Um, so to give you an example of how, how the biblical narrative has shaped our culture and how it should shape us, let me ask you this question. And it's a real question, so I'll just shout out your answer. Why do we love superheroes? They're strong. What else? But villains are strong too. They win. They win. like that. What else? What? Yes, they have, big, they have great powers. They serve others. So if I could combine those answers, that's exactly right. They have great powers that they use sacrificially to serve others. Hmm, wonder who ha who wonder, wonder where they got that idea. Great powers to sacrificially serve others. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome if we knew where that came from? Take a look. God has put us here to look after widows and orphans and to keep himself from being polluted by the world. In other words, we have two jobs, people. Service and purity. Service and purity. In other words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. That's two jobs. That's it. That's what Jesus gave us to do. And this is how it's seen with the superheroes. Superman. He's from another world, yet he's fully human, apparently. Not recognized for his power at Clark Kent. Jesus born in a stable. But when the bad stuff goes down, Superman is there to meet the challenge. Batman. Bruce Wayne uses his resources to save Gotham City. Thor, the Asgardian god of thunder and crown prince, has to undergo suffering before he can rule. Does that sound familiar? All these have elements in Christ in them, but they use their, their powers sacrificially for the good of others. Most of all, Iron Man, all right? So Tony Stark, think about this. Tony Stark goes back in time to save billions of people and give himself for them. Hmm, I wonder who else back in time gave himself to save billions of people. And these superheroes meet the challenges of the baddies like Lex Luthor, the Joker, uh, Loki, and um, uh, Thanos. These are all guys who use their power not for others but for themselves. We call people who use their power for themselves villains. And that's why they need, the world needs superheroes because that's what a lot of people do. And when Tony Stark is here recruiting Peter Parker to be Spider-Man as one of the Avengers, he asks Peter Parker in this scene, so why do you do this? What gets, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What's your ammo? Why, why do you do this? Why, why are you doing all this stuff, this vigilante stuff? And Parker answers him and says, these exact words, he says, when you can do the things I can do, and you don't do it, and the bad stuff happens, it happens because of you. And that's who we are. That's wh who God is. When he saw the bad stuff going on, he came down into it and met it and gave himself for it to give his life for every person here and every person watching and listening. And this is how we know we are following Christ, that we live out that in his image. We then give ourselves to the poor, to the to the, to the, 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 the typical three are the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants, or aliens. Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And James here reminds us that it's not just justice, it is justice, but it is also purity. In verse 27, it's both. It's both justice and purity. It's interesting, liberal churches have historically, liberal Christian churches have historically focused on the social justice part. And they minimize or even excuse the purity part. In fact, I have personally have had discussions with ministers who were excusing gross sins in others and themselves under the biblical guise that we all have feet of clay. And it just made me want to vomit. They say, no, our purity matters to God. Yes, we all have feet of clay. But 
It matters. I desire obedience more than sacrifice. But the conservative churches have typically focused on the purity part and been at least suspicious of the social justice stuff. Like we're going to get kind of dragged away. We're going to compromise the gospel or somehow we're going to get away from the gospel. But people, you really should not have one without the other. For whatever reason, the church just seems to fall into one or two ditches and we've got to lay a hand on both like the scriptures lay a hand on both. James says, don't give up one without the other. Be pure and do good. As does Micah, as does Amos, as does Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so let's do that. Let's be shaped by that word, not bounce around like a ping pong ball between philosophies of different churches and social justice. Don't get caught up. Keep it simple. The Bible is a living book that shapes us in the image of God. And the beautiful thing about the the way it shapes us is it's not just one Christian mold. Like, you know, we kind of get stamped. You know, like I have to lose my identity. No. No. Keep your identity. Make it a renewed identity reborn identity there is no one like you in the kingdom of god nor should there be because god only made one of you and the world needs the redeemed you as you are there's things that you can do and people only you can reach because god put you in this world let the, world, let the word shape you, yes, into God's image, but yes, into the, his image in your way. The Bible is written by about 40 different people, and they use different language and different emphases and different words come up, and that brings such rich texture. And so also in our world, God has, God has a beautifully diverse mixture of people whom he loves and employs for his mission. So let's not be afraid to be shaped by the word. We don't lose our identity. We enrich it. We discover it. We enliven it. And thirdly and finally, the word frees you. It humbles us beautifully and wonderfully, thankfully. It shapes us and it frees us. How's that? Verse 25, the man looks into the perfect law that gives freedom. How is that? It seems impossible that a law could give freedom, and this is why. When I'm driving down the street, and half the street says, no parking, and half the street says, parking, I have half my freedom because the law has taken away half of it, okay? So many people think of laws as simply the absence of freedom. And conversely, they think of freedom as the absence of laws. So laws don't free, they restrict. But the reason that's totally wrong is that freedom should not be defined negatively as the absence of restraint. That's not freedom. Freedom is being released and empowered and taught to be who we were made to be, to fully realize our nature. That's true freedom. The perfect example is the fish. The fish has gills that remove oxygen from the water, has scales and fins. It's perfectly designed to thrive in the water. But what if the fish said, you know, I don't want just water. I want to live on the water and the land. I want to have my choice. Fine. Let's take that fish and put it on the pavement for an hour and see how its freedom serves it. No. The absence of restraint actually destroys the freedom of the fish. The proper restraints free the fish to enjoy the underwater life it was meant to live. There's a lot I could say about this. But the word frees us by giving us the proper restraints fit to our nature to help us run freely in following our good shepherd. Another example besides the fish is a car. So I have a Toyota Highlander, and this little packet came with it. And inside that packet, there's an there's a owner's manual that, that talks about maintenance and oil and oil changes in fact not only do they have that manual they have an entire scheduled maintenance guide that comes with it with all these 
tick boxes of, of maintenance checks to do this, that, and the other. And I'm just, and imagine if I'm reading this and I'm going, these people are so arrogant. Who do they think they are to impose their will on me? Look, it's my car, and I can do with it what I want. I'm not going to spend money on their gimmicks. I'm not going to change my oil. I'm not going to look at my oil. That's, hey, look, if they want to look at their oil and change their oil and do their little maintenance stuff, hey, that's good for them. I'm free from that. I'm not going to be bothered by that. I'm not going to put myself under their thing and kind of taken under their yoke and be a part of their group and get stuck and be oppressed by what, you know, you could go on. You get the point. They don't give us this stuff because they're trying to control us. They give us this because they want to free us to enjoy the gift of the car. That's it. They love us. They, want, they care for us. So they give us the guide so that we can best enjoy the vehicle in the long run. The owner has given us an, a way to best enjoy and delight in this life that he's given us. And we ignore this to our hurt as we ignore that to our hurt. The word frees us to live the, our best life. It's your choice. I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Choose life. One way we're going to work on helping us at Sandhurst is we're going to work together as a body, for those who would like to, on memorizing the Word of God. We're going to be rolling out some resources to learn a verse a week related to the passage. Tomorrow, if you're on Instagram, at Sandhurst1140, you'll get, a, you'll get the verse there. It'll be on Facebook. And we're going to memorize a verse a week. And so we would encourage those who want to to please engage the Word of God and memorize a verse with us each week just to be hiding God's Word in our hearts to continue to mold, to, to, to humble us, to shape us, to free us. So you'll see that coming out tomorrow. There'll be some resources on our website for Bible memory, some apps and some other things, and we'll be talking more about it. But we hope that you'll take a look at that tomorrow and memorize that one verse with us this week. And as we close on Christ... When Adam and Eve were in their garden and they faced their test, they failed their test. When Christ, the second Adam, was in his garden, he passed his test. The word of God had been given to Adam and Eve, and the word of God had been given to Christ. And they, Adam and Eve chose to reject that word, and it brought not life, not freedom, but death and bondage. And Christ said, in his garden, not my will be done, but thy will be done. In other words, may your word be fulfilled, which speaks of the passion and suffering of the chosen one. He accepted and followed the word. He, let, he was humbled by the word, shaped by the word, freed by the word, knowing that that word would bring life. And he emptied himself and made himself obedient to death on the cross that we could have his life. And if you have never been born into the family of God, I would just encourage you, please stay. If you're at home online, read John chapter 3. Give us a shout. You can write me personally, adam.richardson at sandhurst.net. would love to hear from you. That you could give your life to the Lord and meet this, the, the living word, not just the, the written word, but the living word. That that word could be planted in you, as, as verse 22 says, I think. It says, the word that's planted in you, which can save you, May the word of God that has spoken over you bring life to you and to yours. Father in heaven, I thank you for your life in us. I thank you for uh, your word, which is a lamp to our feet, which is a light to our path, but which is more. It reveals your nature, it reveals your, 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 we see there not just, we don't just hear words, but we see a picture of you and a picture of who we are. and We find ourselves and our identity in you. And so Lord, we ask that you, as you gave your life for us, that you would take our lives and let it be always only all for thee. Lord, here we are. We don't understand the times. We don't know what to do, but Lord, our eyes are on you, our good shepherd. 
And may we follow you with faith, with hope, and with love. Through Christ we pray. Amen.